Good. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the afternoon session on methods and method development. Um, we're going to have two speakers in this first part of the session. We're going to have Mark Wilson and, and Ali Ismail. So without further ado, let's just get started. Mark, you have the floor. Thanks very much. Um, welcome to uh, this session, folks, and uh, thanks for the chance to uh, present a little bit of our work. So the systems I'm going to be talking about are chromonic liquid crystals, and I'll explain what they are in, uh, in a very short time. But just uh, before I forget, uh, just to give a few thanks to people in my group who have done some of this work, particularly Martin Walker and Gary Yu, and some of our collaborators at the University of Manchester. So let me just say a little bit about um, chromonic liquid crystals and explain uh, what these systems are. They're essentially unconventional lyotropic liquid crystals that are formed from molecules a bit like this. This is a disc shape molecule. This is sunset yellow, which is a food dye. And uh, these systems self-assemble in water, but in a radically different way to normal amphiophiles. So you'll see that this is uh, an aromatic system, but that it's got various peripheral groups on it and these peripheral groups are the bit that help solubilize it in water. So in chromonic systems, the stacking um, that we get is the self-assembly uh, process that occurs in solution. So for a molecule like sunset yellow, the molecules will stack on top of each other a bit like this. And then at sufficiently high concentrations, these stacks will start to interact with each other. And uh, as they interact, um, when the stacks get long enough, they will align to give you liquid crystal line phases. So a typical schematic looks a little bit like this. This might be a nematic phase that forms from very long columns. Um, and the phase diagram of that would look something like this. At low concentrations, you would get the self-assembly in just an isotropic solution. But at higher concentrations, you would get the formation of the nematic phase. And in this particular example, you would start to get hexagonal packing at even higher concentration. That's called the M or hexagonal phase. Now, just to remind you, this sort of self-assembly is actually very different to what we normally see with conventional lyotropics and conventional amphiophiles. So we don't get the formation of micelles or critical micelle concentrations. We don't get uh, liposomes or bilayers or many of the conventional things that we normally see when we think about self-assembly and formation of liquid crystalline phases. Now, why are we interested in these? Just let me uh, give you one slide to perhaps uh, motivate some of the work that I'll talk about. Because chromonic self-assembly occurs in many dye and drug molecules. And in particular for drug molecules, it's influenced by uh, salts and other small solutes. And of course, that can have uh, quite an important uh, effect on the uptake of drug molecules. For many dye molecules, you get situations like this, where you may have um, certain absorbents, particular wavelengths occurs because of a monomer in solution. But at higher concentration, depending on how, how the aggregation occurs, you get different sorts of um, absorbance uh, occurring. So for example, um, if you get direct stacking of molecules on top of each other, we call that H aggregation, you tend to get a blue shift in the absorbance and you get very often a very broad um, absorbance uh, arising from that aggregation. But uh, sometimes when you get shifted aggregation, we call that J aggregation or jelly, aggregates after the guy who who discovered this you get a very sharp um, absorbance band which is usually shifted to the red and so how these things aggregate in solution is actually rather important and understanding that is quite an interesting thing to do for dye molecules also for these chromonic phases themselves they're actually phases which are very easy to align through either application of fields or by shear and this gives you a mechanism for making self-assembled organic thin film nanostructures. 
So of course there are things like photovoltaic applications for these these sorts of films. You can also use sol gel processes to make inorganic organic hybrids this way. And in some cases you can encapsulate encapsulate small molecules within the sort of structures that we form in solution, which gives you a way of being able to study uh, small molecules under uh, confined conditions. Now, from a simulation point of view, these are inherently interesting systems because they are inherently um, multi-scale simulation problems. So the detailed self-assembly uh, will really depend on the details of molecular interactions. But self-assembly into phases, into fibers, into films requires to, to look at longer uh, time and lens scales, things that we can't really expect to do with all the molecular detail. OK, so let me uh, say a little bit about what simulation can do in terms of uh, shedding insights uh, on, on these sorts of systems. So first of all, of course, um, we can use atomistic simulation as a way of being able to understand the direct self-assembly in isotropic solution. So here's a, a single chromonic molecule. This is, again, this, this food dye, sunset yellow. And of course, using atomistic simulation, we can look at that self-assembly over times of around, well, the typical times I'm putting there of about 350 nanoseconds up to half a million atoms, the sort of thing that's possible on a, on a tier two facility these days. So we tend to use uh, our own version of the GAF force fields with tip 3P water. So we use uh, a full atomistic force field uh, and we um, add in a little bit of uh, improved um, intramolecular potentials from, from uh, careful quantum chemical optimization and slightly better intermolecular interactions from careful uh, small molecule simulations. But with those two provisos, GAF provides a very good force field for looking at this self-assembly behavior in solution. So this just shows you sort of what we do. I'm not showing you the water here, but the self-assembly uh, can directly occur over uh, maybe a few hundred nanoseconds in solution. So this is just uh, the first uh, few hundred nanoseconds where we've seen uh, formation of dimers and beyond. But at higher uh, timescales, you see this assembly into things like this. So this is uh, a chromonic column assembled in water. The blue dots are actually sodium ions. So this is um, an anionic chromonic system. And uh, just as with my cell systems, you get this partial condensation of sodium cations around the structures that aggregate in solution. Now, of course, we can uh, study uh, using this uh, the structure of the aggregates that form. And of course, we can look at some of the thermodynamics of self-assembly in solution. So to do this, one of our techniques is to use potentials of mean force. So typically um, for um, a chromonic system or, or for a set of chromonic systems, you can use umbrella sampling to gradually pull the molecules apart and then accumulate um, uh, the forces from that in order to um, calculate potential of mean force that we can associate with a free energy of association. So I'm showing you an example here. This is uh, for a cyanine dye. This is for PIC, uh, a pseudo isocyanine chloride system. And uh, these curves show you um, the potentials of mean force that we get for dimer, trimer, and tetramers in solution. Now theory tells you that for these sorts of systems, we expect to get isodesmic association. So in other words, we expect to have a free energy of association that's the same for dimers, for trimers, and for tetramers, and for so on. And that would predict an exponential distribution of, um, of, of uh, aggregates in solution in terms of the length of aggregates you get. Now, that's only approximately correct. And in most of the systems we look at, um, a better word is the word pseudo isodesmic because it's usually the dimer which is much more strongly bound uh, 
and then the trimer and the tetramers um, and so on seem to have a very similar uh, potential of mean force. Now, of course, these calculations can be done as a function of temperature. And if you do that, you can use a van der Hoff plot and extract out from that the enthalpic and the entropic contributions to the free energy. So if you do this for a molecule such as PIC here, then you find that most of the contribution to the free energy for this system, which is cationic in nature, arises from the enthalpy contribution that you get to association. There's a very small T delta S term, which in this case is negative, and so actually does favor the association, but in some cases actually is small and positive. Now, this is not true for all chromonic systems, and I'll show you uh, one more example of that. So this is um, actually a non-ionic chromonic system. So this is actually uh, a chromonic that's a little bit akin to uh, a non-ionic um, amphiophile that you might get uh, in, in detergent systems. So we're using ethylene oxide chains to um, represent the hydrophilic parts of this molecule that are going to solubilize it around a triphenylene core. And for these systems, we tend to find that the hydrophobic effect in solution is extremely strong. And so if you uh, work out the enthalpic and the entropic contributions to association, it's actually the entropic effect which is actually dominant for these. So these four are actually quite strong aggregates and quite long aggregates, but fairly flexible long chains in solution. Now, of course, with this sort of methodology, it allows us to go back and understand many of the rather unclear things from some of the dye and drug literature in the past. And I'll just show you one example of this uh, before I move on. This is, uh, again, for a cyanine uh, dye that's uh, used in photography. And uh, this is the unusual sort of uh, phase diagram that people found when they looked at dyes like this. So um, at low concentrations, you get the same sort of aggregates that we've uh, talked about in solution. But at higher concentrations, you get um, a phase diagram that looks a little bit like this. So N here represents the nematic phase, uh, which is uh, obviously formed from long aggregates. But at very high concentrations, we have a totally different form of self-assembly to form something which the textures under an optical microscope tell us are smectic in terms of the liquid crystal behavior. But it's very unclear what would be smectic in terms of the aggregates that form. So simulation should shed light on this. The other sort of mystery that happens with these dyes in solutions is this clearly complex um, aggregation behavior going on where you have a complex equilibrium between monomers and some of the H and J aggregates that lead to both blue shifts and red shifts depending on how molecules come together. Now of course simulation gives us the tools to be able to understand how that happens and at low concentrations directly in the simulations you find this form of H aggregate that's shown here in the picture. So this is a very unusual sort of system that forms where you get a sort of stepwise ladder of molecules where you get alternating uh, sulfonate groups on either side of the stack as you go up. So this is a sort of ladder. Um, if you look down on top of it, it looks something like uh, the picture that's shown there. Separation is the typical um, organic aromatic uh, stacking separation of about 0 0.35 uh, nanometers that you can see from X-ray. But it's this H aggregate behavior that leads to blue shifts at low concentration. So the free energy of association for these is pretty high. It's approaching 40 kilojoules per mole. But if you go to higher concentrations, you get a radical change in terms of what happens in the self-assembly. 
So what happens uh, is we have quite long stacks, which suddenly start to break up. And then the long stacks will aggregate together to form layer structures. And this is this smectic behavior, which is also responsible for these J aggregates in solution and the sharp um, absorbance peaks that we often see with uh, dyes of this type in solution. So what happens essentially is you form a layer, the sulfonates, which are the water soluble parts, um, go to the top and the bottom, and you form essentially a sulfonate sandwich. And uh, it's these little platelets that give rise uh, initially to these uh, sharp absorbents, uh, which is red shifted in the spectrum. Now, we've actually seen a whole range of uh, rather interesting um, aggregation behavior in solution. So you can get um, long, flexible, single aggregates. You can get systems which form branching columns so that you get almost fractal behavior. You can get the H aggregates that you've seen. And you can get systems where we have a complex mixture of both H and J aggregation in solution. Now, I mentioned this is in, inherently uh, a multi-scale uh, problem because we would quite like to know what happens when you go to these higher concentrations. Now, although we can simulate for a few hundred um, nanoseconds quite comfortably with these sorts of models, this is not sufficient to look at um, the self-assembly of full chromonic phases. And to do this, we need to push up to simulation times that are comparable to a millisecond or beyond. So to do this, we need to introduce coarse-grained techniques in which we radically um, speed up the aggregation behavior. So to do this, uh, we're gonna use um, structural coarse-graining where we replace parts of our molecule um, by a bead and spring, uh, by a bead and spring model. Now, essentially, there's two main approaches to do this, and you'll have seen some of this from one or two talks earlier in this meeting. Either to use experimental data to help us, this is the top-down approaches to uh, coarse graining, or to use a reference atomistic model where we use bottom-up approaches. So uh, the latter is to use techniques like iterative Boltzmann inversion or the multi-scale coarse graining method of Voth and uh, Will Noid and others. For the top-down approaches, you can use things like SAF Gamma Mi and the engineering approaches, or indeed Martini models, which are often used for biological uh, simulations. What I would say is that chromonics provides an extremely challenging test system for coarse graining because we need to be able to capture both the details of the aggregation, but also the thermodynamics of the self-assembly. And both of those together are a major challenge. Okay, so let me try and uh, summarize what we see in some of these systems. And uh, probably uh, a very good thing to start with is uh, this quote from uh, Animal Farm uh, oh. by George Orwell. So Orwell says that all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And this is definitely something that you can apply to pair potentials, because it's certainly true that all pair potentials are non-transferable. But our experience with this uh, sort of um, models are that some per pair potentials are certainly more non-transferable than others. And the reason for this, of course, is the volume and the temperature dependence of coarse grain pair potentials. And for chronic systems, this can be extreme. And it's the same sort of problem that we sometimes see with biological systems when we try and coarse grain them in water. So our experience is that the bottom-up strategies are relatively poor. So the iterative Boltzmann inversion and the forced matching, um, both of them will lead to uh, chromonic aggregates, but you have to get both the chromonic aggregation and the thermodynamics correct in order um, to get correct behavior and solution. For here, for these systems, it's often the hydration energy that fails. 
So um, as you can see here in a sort of typical failure system, you can recover chromonic stacking, but often if you don't get the hydration free energy correct, then you get aggregates of stacks. And so you don't see the usual behavior that we should get as we increase concentration. But actually the top-down strategies work remarkably well, even though they're also based on pair potentials. So SAF Gamma Me works quite well. Um, the one weakness with uh, that as an engineering theory is that the conventional combining rules don't work tremendously well, and you often need mixing data to parameterize that. But what works especially well for us is the Martini models. So Martini Free, if tuned well, works surprisingly well and it allows us to be able to capture both the atomistic free energies of association but also it allows us to be able to capture um, the hydration free energy and also what happens as you change concentration so we get both the thermodynamics and also the structure within the framework of a simple pair potential now martini out of the box uh, works reasonably well, but to really make Martini work as well as it ought to, you need to be very careful in tuning the hydration-free energies for parts of your molecule. And if you reproduce those correctly, then it actually does a very, very good job of recovering the sort of uh, PMFs that we see in an atomistic model. Okay, now I'm almost out of time. So I just want to show you one final thing before I finish. And that is that these systems also um, lend themselves very nicely to coarse graining through dissipative particle dynamics. And that's a technique that's actually been very successful for conventional lyotropic systems. You use soft interaction potentials and very long time steps within a simulation. We can parameterize uh, potentials based on uh, solubility data and transfer free energies. And that combination, along with uh, the potentials of mean force that we have from an atomistic simulation, allows us to be able to simulate very large systems and explore entire phase diagrams. And actually, this is really powerful. Let me just uh, show you uh, how this can be applied to chromonic system. So this is the TPEO 2M non-ionic chrom uh, chromonic system that I showed you a little bit earlier. This is the phase diagram that's uh, seen experimentally. And actually uh, from the potential of mean force, which gives us um, our one uh, tunable parameter for, for DPD along with the solubility data, we can get models which um, actually do a fantastic job of reproducing the chromonic self-assembly. So this is what our, our DPD model looks like. It looks like a planar disk with hydrophobic parts and then hydrophilic uh, side groups. And uh, that's the uh, DPD interaction table there. So this is uh, what happens if you attempt to simulate the entire chromonic phase using DPD. So um, in an isotropic phase, we get this whole range of different stacks, which in fact do, do down to a dimer follow an isodesmic um, self-assembly behavior where you get this exponential fall off in stack sizes. As you push this to higher concentrations, eventually our stacks become longer. As our stacks become longer, they will spontaneously align and you get the formation of the matic phases. In fact, if we push this to much higher concentrations, you can even see the M phase that forms um, at very high concentrations when stacks start to pack in a hexagonal arrangement. Okay, well, I've, I've had my time, so I'm gonna skip uh, the final part uh, of this talk and uh, skip to uh, my summary slide and uh, that's just a summary with thanks to the people who have done the work and a summary of the atomistic and the coarse grained uh, results uh, from these studies and thank you uh, and any questions <laughs>
Thank you, Mark. Um, as you're saying, any questions? If not, I can um, get things started off. So this is a really nice multi-scale um, study. Um, is there any interest in going to a smaller length scale? Are you interested in um, sort of taking parts of your system and looking at the at the actual spectra, or is that not in your scope? Yeah, I think it is, uh, David. We haven't done a lot, a lot of uh, that work, um, but one of the things that you get that's really nice with these chromonics is that um, particularly in the J aggregate regime, you can form all sorts of things like nanowires. So um, if you take some of these uh, J aggregate sheets um, that I talked about, uh, under certain conditions, the, these will actually fold round to give you a sort of uh, nano wire mm -hmm. of chromonic systems. And these do very, very sharp um, absorbances um, with these very, very strong red shifts. So it would actually be really rather cool to have a go at, mm -hmm. uh, at uh, doing, um, if you like, uh, uh, band gap simulations for those sorts of systems. So we haven't really done that, but um, it would actually be a very nice thing to do. Uh, one of the things we have done quantum mechanically is look at things like how uh, the NMR uh, coupling changes and the chemical shifts change as you slide molecules on top of each other. And okay. actually you can correlate that very nicely uh, with what happens in solution as you start to get aggregation. So we have done that. Beautiful, very nice. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Andre. Um, great talk, Mark. Did you try to back map your coarse grain structures? We have done a little bit of that. Um, so particularly with the Martini model, it lends itself uh, to back mapping. So we can go from, uh, so what we tend to do if we do that is that during the simulation, you can keep a track of the center of your group. And uh, as you do that, um, you can uh, go back and back map that onto um, what the atomistic structure looks like. Now, one of the things that we've used with that is to make a combined atomistic and martini model. So it's basically another way of being able to coarse grain out um, the solvent. Now, the solvent obviously takes 80, 90% of the simulation time. And if you can coarse grain that out with something like a martini solvent or something else, then that's actually quite a nice thing to do. We've actually had a little bit of success to be able to do coarse graining in that way. So the aggregate behavior is atomistic for that model, but then the, you've coarse grained out solvent by having the atomistic model interact with a coarse grained martini solvent. So that's actually worked quite well. Very nice. Thank you. So um, I think we're out of time now. Um, I, Andre has another question, but it looks like it's related to the first question. So I'll leave you to uh, sort that out amongst yourselves uh, later on. <laughs> but thank you for a really lovely talk. And, Thanks, David. Uh,